welcome to the show, where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Erica Moseson. She is a pulmonary and critical care physician, and she's the founder of Air Health, Our Health, an educational website on the importance of healthy air and a stable climate. She wrote the Kevin MD article, Apocalypse Now, Climate Change, Cardiac Arrest, and the Price of Inaction. Erica, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? Absolutely. So I'm a pulmonary critical care medicine doctor, which means I split my time between the ICU, you know, taking care of patients on life support, ventilators. Um, Obviously, that's huge right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a large part of my life. Um, And I also see patients in the clinic who are suffering from lung diseases, everything from asthma to occupational exposures. And um, I, I love it. It's one of the things I love about my job is that I get to be in the clinic and kind of be someone's doctor for a lifetime. And then I also get to be in the ICU and do all the really exciting things in medicine, you know, having patients who need emergency procedures and life support and really trying to rescue people when they get very, very sick. And I find that whole spectrum very satisfying. But one thing I started to really notice the more I did this is how much so many of these patients that were critically ill were there because of air quality, really. And, you know, most dramatically, I think we're familiar with smoking, right? If you're smoking and sucking cigarettes into your lungs, that has a lot of um, toxins in it. And in particular, particulate matter, PM 2.5, which I focus on a lot, um, that can make people very sick over their lifetime and acutely. It can set their kids up for lifetime diseases. But a lot of other things, you know, from, you know, occupational exposures to just the chronic burden of diesel exhaust and air pollution that's in all of our communities that actually makes a lot of people sick, that's almost invisible to us. And so one of the things I did when I started Air Health, Our Health was just kind of trying to make the invisible visible. Like the air is, you know, kind of invisible most of the time, except in the cases of, you know, severe wildfires, but it actually really determines a lot of our health. And I think sometimes people think, oh, that heart attack and the non-smoker came out of nowhere, or that stroke came out of nowhere. And it really doesn't come out of nowhere. A lot of the time it comes from kind of the chronic toll of unhealthy air. Um, And so I just wanted to start a website and then the podcast actually, where I kind of interviewed different scientists who've looked into this, everything on, you know, the changing pollen burden in our air to the changing, you know, diesel in our cities, to what it means to live under an airport, um, to what vaping does to the lungs. Um, and, and wild, including wildfire smoke. So I kind of view it as part of my mission to avoid having people need to meet me professionally <laughs> by cleaning up the air they breathe. <laughs> All right. So let's transition into your Kevin MD article, which I'm sure you're going to talk more about this issue. Apocalypse now, climate change, cardiac arrest, and the price of inaction. Now, for those who haven't read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share um, why you decided to write it? Yeah, absolutely. So out here on the West Coast of the United States, um, I think essentially our entire coast was on fire this um, end of the summer and the early fall, um, where, you know, the satellite images from space were heart stopping. I mean, you just saw, you know, fire up and down the coast um, and we were just pouring, you know, smoke into the air um, and everyone was looking, you know, at the air now, you know, quality indicators um, where many of us were which were showing you know, air quality beyond the hazard index. The, one of the things I focused on a lot is uh, one particular element of smoke, which is PM2.5, which is a form of particulate matter that's, that's so small. So it's measured under, you know, the particulate matter is kind of size based on microns. So 10 is you know, 10 microns, PM2.5 is anything less than 2.5. And that, the, the visible smoke is, I think, easier for us to see, but it's these smaller particles that are actually really, really deadly because they get all the way into our lungs and out into our bloodstream and circulate all over our body, causing disease. They actually cause um, massive inflammatory changes in the blood vessels. Um, They, you know, chronically can lead to like atherosclerosis. Um, But we know from studies with traffic that, you know, kind of spikes in this PM 2.5 can actually cause heart attacks and strokes in the short term. And so when you get this massive bolus of all this smoke, you know, it, it only makes sense that you would actually have acute um, effects, right? So, you know, wildland firefighters actually are often more at risk of, you know, having a heart attack. And this, you know, one of the studies I focused on just kind of as a more dramatic example of this is sudden cardiac death is literally just dropping dead um, from, you know, probably an arrhythmia or a sudden, um, you know, plaque rupture event. 
Um, and that goes up um, after exposure to um, wildfire smoke. They looked at this in California after some of their wildfires several years ago. And then I've also, you know, looked into this and, you know, other arenas. And on this article, I just remember sitting there as a, a pulmonary critical care doctor. I was in my house where for which I having a lot of privilege and purchased a very nice whole house air filtration system and thinking about my three kids and realizing, you know, one of the main drivers of these just completely catastrophic wildfires, you know, is the fact that our climate is changing. It's getting warmer where, you know, things are drier and we have these forests that are filled with fuel for a whole variety of historical reasons. And, you know, thinking of myself as both a mom and an ICU doctor and someone who has done science and understands the science, you know, to some degree on climate change, that this is only, this is built in at least for the next 30 to 40 years. And just wondering, when are we going to do something? Like, when are we as physicians and scientists and a community going to decide that, you know, having massive waves of our own populations, you know, getting sick and dying from the smoke from these events, um, and both, and people can be sick for years following some of these, these smoke events. Um, and thinking about the massive burden on the healthcare system. So not even just the acute death, uh, you know, and cost of, you know, fire being destructive, but actually the health toll that it's going to take, which is potentially only going to increase. Um, I think a lot of the times we don't think about the cost of inaction. We just mm -hmm. think about, oh, well, fixing climate change is going to mean, you know, we need to buy different trucks and we're going to have to put in electric charging stations and that costs money and I don't have money. But if we don't pay attention to how much, we are spending by not taking action um, and the devastation that that's causing economically. I mean, there's entire parts of our country that rely on tourism that were essentially shut down for a month because of the smoke and the fires. And so there is a huge economic cost, even if you're not worried about the lives, which of course we all sure. are, but just thinking about the cost of doing nothing on climate change is it has been too high for a long time and it's becoming impossibly high. So you talk about these small micron, these 2.5 micron particles mm -hmm. that can arise from smoke. Now, what are the biggest producers of something like this? Is it just purely from, from cars, from factories, from wildfires? Like for those of us who are away from wildfires, what are some typical sources of, of these particles? Yeah, well, it really depends where you live. So um, the, um, there's kind of, there are different emissions inventories depending on where people live. So kind of around... Um, you know, around the United States, a lot of it comes from, from the transportation sector and then energy production. And so, um, you know, frequently your local American Lung Association chapter probably mm -hmm. could point you in the direction of um, where the local state in, um, or community inventory is or your local Department of Environmental Quality. Um, and so, you know, chronically, a lot of it is from traffic related air pollution. Um, the passenger vehicle sector has been getting a lot cleaner. Um, but the transportation, unfortunately, still often relies on these, you know, kind of bigger diesel trucks or trains, ships um, that frequently have, you know, a higher proportion of our emissions now. Um, and um, obviously power generation, right? So if you're living near a coal powered power, the um, coal fired power plant, that can mm -hmm. also be a, a large source. Um, and the thing that's hard is we know that PM 2.5 causes disease over the short and long term. And so you can see, um, you know, premature birth, um, you know, so I, I can't say it's womb to tomb, right? You can see premature birth, you can see heart attacks and strokes, you can see, you know, cognitive changes later in life. Um, there's, you know, children who are exposed to high levels of traffic related air pollution in the first year of life are more likely to have asthma by age seven. I mean, it gets really granular. You can actually see MRI changes in children's brains um, based on their exposure. You can see, you know, you can have kids kind of, you know, cough you know, they're sputum into a cup and measure um, black carbon in the macrophages. And you can actually correlate that with lung function. Also ozone is another, you know, element that gets produced that, you know, is kind of a secondary pollutant that kind of reacts with some of the primary um, pollutants. And that is independently can cause emphysema. Even if people have never smoked, you can actually get, you know, pretty significant emphysema from breathing these things. So it's, it's kind of this chronic burden. And I increasingly, the more I learn about it, it just reminds me of tobacco kind of once upon a time, we mm -hmm. thought, well, tobacco can't be that bad. Everyone smokes, right? And then it's, oh, oops, it turns out it is that bad. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe smoking yourself is bad, but secondary smoke can't be that bad, right? No, oh, it turns out that's a big deal. So unfortunately, our lungs, um, I always try to tell my patients, our lungs don't really care what you mean to do. <laughs> They're not that smart. They only can breathe in what's actually coming into them. So it's, uh, um, it, you know, it is a real burden. I think it's interesting. I was interviewing someone on our podcast where in Europe now, um, uh, air pollution has surpassed smoking in the cause of death. 
um, in terms of, in, you know, modifiable, well, hopefully modifiable risk factors. And um, there are now more Europeans dying from traffic-related air pollution than cigarettes, which is wild, because I remember studying abroad my junior year in Italy and everyone was smoking. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there certainly is a difference between smoking and secondhand smoke and pollution from like from traffic, which you can't really mm-hmm. see. Now, is this something that you can measure? Um, and uh, mm-hmm. and in terms of solving it from an individual household perspective, is it a matter of just buying air, air filters? Like, how can we uh, tackle this from an individual yeah, household perspective? And so- yeah, one of the hardest things from kind of a fairness perspective is one of the biggest determinants of indoor air quality is outdoor air quality. So, um, you know, and unfortunately, people who um, one of the the sadder elements of this is that, you know, people who are more well off tend to try to get themselves housing in, in places with cleaner air. And then the people who are left to kind of live by the freeways and the train tracks and everything tend to already have different things going against them in life. And then it gets compounded by this kind of chronic burden of illness. Um, you know, we see, for example, you know, black kids are more likely to die of asthma than, um, you know, wealthier or wider community, you know, counterparts, and there's a lot of inequities in in air pollution. So that's hard because, you know, it's hard to move your house, right? Right. But if you, you know, you do have a house, um, air filtration systems can work. Um, You can, there's, and this is something where you actually have a resource on my website um, on different air filter systems. Kind of, there's a lot of uh, pseudoscience out there. And so there's a lot of things that people will sell you, like, ozone generators and things that are probably not good. Um, But doing, you know, air filtration systems can be helpful. There are monitors. So the criteria air pollutants under the Clean Air Act, which includes PM 2.5, do require kind of monitors that are, they have the Department of Environmental Quality will have like very nice, um, very highly calibrated, sophisticated monitors. The issue is there aren't that many of them. And it turns out traffic related air pollution can be a very hyper local phenomenon. Like a lot of these things can fall off um, pretty close um, to the roads. Um, so what, there are some kind of DIY monitor networks that you can kind of participate in. You usually are sacrificing accuracy a little bit, but it, gives, it can give you a little more granular data. A lot of people with the fires were looking at a system called Purple Air um, because that, that one, there's a lot of people that participate in it. Um, but again, there's the, those monitors are potentially a little less accurate, but if there's mm-hmm. a bunch of them in an area, it can probably give you like a big picture view. Other things, kind of basic things. So if you're, you know, driving in a car, it does seem like having your, when you're in heavy traffic, that's where a lot of people are exposed. Like I personally have a lot of drivers in my lung practice. And I think a lot of this has to do both with auto pollution from driving, you know, some of these bigger diesel engines their whole life. And then also just sitting in traffic a lot. So seeming to have, you know, windows up and recirc, um, the recirc on when you're driving probably protects you um, from the, or does seem to drop the particulate burden inside. Um, a lot of these studies actually come out of London because they have such a high burden of sure. PM 2.5 and then they've studied, you know, their, their cab drivers. The other thing is um, it does seem that there is, uh, there is auto pollution from the engine um, that you're ri- driving. So, you know, if you can uh, swing an electric car, it's good for the planet, good for your wallet, and also probably exposes you to a little less um, particulate matter. And I think in London, when they looked at the difference between a cabbie driving a one of the classic, you know, black cabs versus one of the newer hybrid cabs, they had lower exposure. And then obviously when it's very fulminant and dramatic, um, an N95 mask or a respirator can actually can decrease the particulate matter burden you're breathing. Um, but, you know, overall, it's, there's all these kind of individual things, but those individual actions are individually also a lot more expensive than taking a more kind of community-wide approach to just decrease the burden up front. And I'm convinced that the savings in healthcare you know, costs and maintaining an economy alone would, you know, make it a wise investment. So that's why I encourage people to think about, you know, actions to clean up the air as investments. Um, You know, I always remind people that the, I think the Clean Air Act had over a 20% annualized rate of return, like who wouldn't want that for their, you know, Mm -hmm. retirement portfolio, right? So you invest money to clean up the air and you generate a lot of health and economic activity. We're talking to Erica Moseson. She is a pulmonary and critical care physician and the founder of Air Health, Our Health, and wrote the Kevin MD article, Apocalypse Now, Climate Change, Cardiac Arrest, and the Price of Inaction. Erica, from an individual clinician standpoint, what are some things that we can do to help address the issues that you bring up? Well, I think one thing that surprised me is um, I think a lot of the times doctors, we spend so much time becoming experts in what we do. And then we think that there are, you know, and there's always like experts above us who kind of dive down into these smaller areas. But I think we need to remember to kind of turn away from just talking to each other and become advocates and speak to our 
you know, other people in our community about these things. So I remember, you know, personally, I got asked by the American Lung Association one point to go ex talk to some legislators at my, our local state capital about diesel. Um, and it was just, it's so wild how a lack of scientific education there is, because I think we do so much science training that we all think of ourselves as, oh, well, you know, I only know a little bit of science, but we actually as doctors are maybe the most scientifically literate person that most that most people know, right? And in, in their, you know, most people in their day-to-day -day lives, the person who's maybe even been the most exposed to science is their doctor. And so that ability as a doctor to kind of translate, you know, the the scientific speak and the the studies to our patients and what it means in their real lives. And then also I think there's a role of the doctor to be the doctor for their community too, to, you know, for the air to kind of um, air quality to kind of speak to you know, city councils or the, your local congressperson or legislator, or, you know, whoever, and, and explain about why these things matter. And um, because the, you know, obviously the, the industries and the businesses will always be, you know, having their perspective. And I think, um, so that role of, you know, physician as advocate, both to kind of translate science to patients, but also to kind of share with the bigger community. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I think COVID-19 right now is a, a perfect example is this, you know, I think it's been shocking to a lot of us how, profound the lack of understanding about kind of basic scientific principles mm -hmm. is and how um, wishful thinking doesn't make <laughs> doesn't make results different. So I think doctors kind of getting outside our comfort zones and recognizing that we actually are experts, mm -hmm. um, you know, at our community levels and being able to share that knowledge um, to help people see how important clean air is, how help people see how important, you know, virus free air is, <laughs> is uh, really important. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Don't light things on fire and breathe them into your lungs. Well said. Well, thanks again for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for all you do.